going to be considering the healing of two blind men by Jesus the Savior. And before we read that passage in Matthew chapter 9 and verses 27 through 31, I want us to turn to a prophet, the prophet Isaiah, and three passages that are relevant to the healing of Jesus and the fulfillment of prophecy in this healing of Jesus Christ of two blind men. And the prophecies, the prophecy of Isaiah, we turn to at three points, uh, chapter 29, chapter 35, and chapter 42. So let's take our Bibles and read these passages. They're brief. Isaiah 29, first of all, and verses 17 through 19. I won't make much comment on these. Isaiah 29, 17 through 19. Is it not yet a very little while till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be esteemed as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Just this comment, this is the way the prophet is uh, prophesying of the day of the Lord, of the arrival of Messiah, and the wonderful messianic blessings in him, and a principal blessing of which is, the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness, they shall be open. So now let's turn to Isaiah 35. Isaiah 29, we read, Isaiah 35, this perhaps more well-known passage, I want to read again of this messianic blessing of the day of the Lord, verses 1 and 2 and 5 and 6. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. In verses 5 and 6, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. That's Isaiah 35, those verses. And now Isaiah 42, one last passage. Isaiah 42, and verse 1, 6, and 7. Isaiah 42, 1, 6, and 7. This is one of the servant passages, speaking of Jesus, Son of God, becomes servant of God. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And then verses 6 and 7. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. He's speaking to his servant. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness, from the prison house. Thus far we read the prophecy of Isaiah fulfilled in Matthew chapter 9 verses 27 through 31. Context here is Jesus has just uh, raised up Jairus's daughter and he is now departed from there. So that's the context and then the blind men start following him. Verse 27 Matthew 9. When Jesus departed from there Two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. That's as far as we'll read 
God has spoken. May we respond believingly and now hear the preaching of this word. I would begin by reminding us of what Matthew's all about, and that is the revelation of the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew's particular uh, inspired uh, uh, focus. He would focus us on the coming of the kingdom of heaven as fulfillment, especially of all the promises uh, that are made in the Old Testament. For this kingdom to come, there must be a king. So Matthew is all about Jesus, the king, who is the king of this kingdom. And so this has been proven by Matthew in so many different ways. And we saw this, for example, in his teaching, or we see this in his teaching, that he speaks as one with authority. Remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, the people were astonished at his words, for he taught them as one having authority. He wasn't just this person come up with his own doctrines. He comes with the right to speak and the authority to speak as from heaven, representing God. This is what was different about Jesus. He speaks not his own word even, even though he is the word of God, but he speaks the word of God. And so by his words, Matthew 8 and 9, we have been seeing in several sermons about his miracles, is Jesus proving not only in word, but in his works that he is the one from God. He has the authority to still the waves and the wind. He has the authority over demons, and he casts them out. He has the authority and the right to um, heal leprosy and to raise the dead and all of these things we've been seeing. And so he's proving that he is the Messiah. In these last uh, little cluster of miracles here at the end of chapter 9, there's a couple of miracles here and also the response uh, to the miracles by certain people. We'll be focusing on that in these next sermons. But the question is, are people seeing this? Are people seeing that Jesus, by his instruction and by his miracles, is the Messiah? Are they understanding it, seeing it in order to believe it? No one yet has declared that he's Messiah, but lo and behold, those who cannot see, blind men, lead the way in declaring that Jesus is Messiah. They do this when they follow him from one house, Jairus' house, to another, and they cry out repeatedly, such is the, the Greek language, they're crying out repeatedly, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on us. This was their declaration and leading the way in this declaration that Jesus who's healing, Jesus who's teaching, is the promised Messiah. So we want to hear the blind men. We want to hear of their testimony as we consider Jesus' healing of those two blind men. First of all, we want to see that they come to Messiah by faith. Secondly, that they are healed as they have believed, as Jesus says, according to your faith, let it be to you. And then finally, we want to consider what seems to be an anomaly, something that doesn't fit. That is, they go their way contrary to the word of Jesus who told them, be quiet, and they spread the news almost like so many gossipers who are overwhelmed with joy but are disobedient to the Savior. So I entitle my last point, that they go their way evangelizing in unbelief. They come to Jesus by faith. They're healed according to their faith, Jesus says, and then they go their own way evangelizing in unbelief. Now, there are lots of lessons for us here today, but the first one we want to consider is that these led the way in coming to Messiah by faith. <clears throat> it is one of those terrible results of sin is blindness. And we read that in ancient times and in Middle Eastern countries, especially before all of the technology and the knowledge of what it is to be healthy uh, that we have, blindness was especially a scourge upon the land. Many, many blind people, perhaps much more percentage-wise than, than here today. 
And a terrible thing, of course, because you can't see. And children in those days either, they, they also could not work. That, that is, there weren't the opportunities to, to help people like this. There weren't guide dogs, perhaps, as we know them and all of these things. And so they were beggars. A lot of them were beggars. And it was a terrible plight for them, of course, who wants to be begging all their life, and, and even when they're sincere in their begging and not faking it. They're blind, can't see. I hope we never make fun of blind people or anyone else who's handicapped. Uh, it's a terrible thing. It must be a terrible thing. But um, the worst thing about it was that this was a picture of sin and its consequences. In fact, in those days, such calamities like blind calamities or maybe uh, congenital defects as we call them were considered by many a judgment of God. Now, Jesus disabuses people of that notion when he says no it's not about that. There's not an exact correspondence between disease and judgment. But nevertheless that was the popular opinion even among the Jews. So leprosy maybe or blindness or being maimed or whatever from birth considered judgments. Besides that, too, according to the law of Moses, there was a hindrance of blind people from worshiping. They could not go near the altars or the offerings. I'm not so sure that it was as stringent with lepers, but they themselves were hindered in their worship because of their being blind. The idea is that only those who were perfect, I suppose, could enter into the presence of God. Those who were not maimed or diseased or whatever and otherwise rendered unclean. So this was this stigma and this was this fact. This was this, um, this terrible plight upon two blind men like these who approach David. In fact, it seems that there's two, we don't know why, simply because well, misery enjoys the empathy of other miserable people. So they join together and they follow Jesus and cry out, be merciful to us. The blindness is, in fact, a picture of our own sin and of everybody's sin. And that's what it's here for in the Bible, to remind us of just the plight of human, the human race. Jesus will speak of this, and the Apostle Paul and the Old Testament reminds us too, that the fall into sin has blinded us, not just with our eyes and our optic nerves and the retina and so on, but with our souls. And the blindness is called a lack of understanding. We cannot see spiritually things of God. Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians 2. He says the natural man doesn't understand the things of God. Uh, Romans 8, 7 and 8 speaks of the carnal mind, which is enmity against God. And over and over again, the judgment upon Israel is that they see and yet they cannot understand and God gives them over to the blindness of their own eyes or their own, uh, their own sin. John 9, you can read that for yourselves and for your families later, but that's a huge chapter on the blindness of Israel. John 9 is when Jesus heals a man born blind from birth and it's at the festival of lights and everybody is missing Jesus who is the light of the world and who shows this by his healing this blind man then. But he speaks to them of being blind leaders of the blind then, the Pharisees. He speaks of their not understanding him because of their sin. This is the way it is in this world. We're all these blind people. We all have our strong opinions and we strut about and we make them. We think we learn a few things when we go on the internet and we have this, this knowledge that's a mile wide and an inch deep. That's not wisdom. And yet we're blind. This is our nature. And the tendency to spout our own uh, uh, opinions like roosters in the morning, we've discovered something, is that uh, this just shows the prideness, the, the pride we have in our own um, deceit, in our own foolish opinions. Well, these men here are not blind spiritually. And they are ones who show this by coming to Jesus 
and they show that they have been visited in the soul. There's something about these blind men that uh, leads us to understand that the faith they had was saving faith. Somehow they were given to be joined to the things of heaven and to cry out for mercy and to follow the Messiah wherever he would go that they might be healed by him. And they are those who, in other words, are given eyes to see. They are given eyes to see what we sang with the psalmist in Psalm 27, Jehovah is my light. And when they are attracted to Jesus, this is no mere charade of theirs, no mere just wanting the earthly sight, but it's a, it's a, it's a picture and an evidence that they already see something that so many people were not understanding, they understood. And they led the way in coming to Jesus, the Messiah. They went to the right person. They went to the Son of God, whom they cry out is the Son of David. This is something that leads the way in a discovery to the people that Jesus is Messiah. Matthew is at pains, in fact, to speak of Jesus as the Messiah, as the son of David. The very first words in Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1, speak of him as the son of David, or he's in that line of David. And so, ten other times, or ten times total in Matthew, we have this appellation of Jesus, his name, this title, son of David. Now this is all to show that he's in the line of the promise that was made to David. In 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16, I believe, there David is promised a son. And the son would be Solomon, of course, who would build the temple. But uh, this son also would reign in Israel, and his reign would be eternal. This is a picture of Messiah. And about the time when Jesus is coming, this indeed was understood that the son of David would be the Messiah. And so, so to call someone the son of David was not just to say, well, he has David as his father, but to pronounce that someone was the son of David was to pronounce him to be the, 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 the prophesied Christ of God, the Messiah, the anointed one who would heal Israel of their sins and miseries and their blindnesses and everything else. He would be their peace and he would be the representative of God. And so they're crying out. And this shows that they have this connection with Jesus. They don't see him, but they cry out to him just who he is. And this is so important for us to remember when we pray to God. You remind yourself of who God is to whom you're coming. He is the son of David. This is what they're saying. And he is this one who is the Messiah. He is the promised one, in other words. He comes just according to the promise that God made. He's the fulfillment of this wonderful promise to Israel and to all the elect of God. Besides that, uh, as uh, or after Jesus uh, asked them, do you believe that I am able to do this? When they say, yes, Lord, they are speaking here not merely out of respect. Some people think that. And it's true that the name Lord was a common way of addressing people with respect, not just someone who was in authority, in great position like a prince, but anyone who was respectable could have been called something like Lord. Well, I believe that because these men here, these blind men, are believers, they're calling Jesus Lord, and maybe they don't understand this completely, but they're revealing that Jesus is more than just a son of David. He's David's Lord. This is brought out in Luke chapter 20. And uh, <clears throat> when it said, when the scribes come to him, and Jesus says to them in verse 41, how can they say that Christ is the son of David? Now David himself said in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, this is Psalm 110, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David calls him Lord. How is he then his son? So what Jesus is doing there, something that is recognized in some way by these blind men, 
is saying that he is more than a son of David, more than a mere man, more than an earthling. He's the Lord. He's the absolute monarch who's come. Yes, Lord, they say, son of David. Yes, Lord, the one who has created the world and the one by whom and for whom the worlds were created. This is a remarkable revelation here and a confession here made by these blind men leading the way in and among these people, among whom had been done many miracles by this point, and much instruction had been given to them, but they lead the way with their perception. The perception, as our catechism says, the knowledge of faith. And the knowledge, too, that this son of David and this Lord was my Savior and my Lord. Now, they come to Jesus. Um, they, they follow Jesus, first of all. You might wonder, how do blind men follow Jesus? He's, he gets out of the house of Jairus, and you get the impression that immediately when Jesus departed from there, he's outside the house, two blind men began following him. And they began crying out to him and saying, David, have mercy on us. David, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on us. And the idea, again, according to the language, is that they were continually doing this. As long as Jesus was going from one house to this next house, which may have been Peter's or someplace where Jesus was lodging, as long as he was going there, they're crying out and they're crying out loudly. That's the idea. It's like a crow. They're, they're raucous. Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on us. They will be heard. And no doubt they're following him. They're able to because the crowd maybe is leading them along. And they're, they're just following the crowd. They're maybe with friends or whoever. But the center of their attention is this Jesus. And you get the impression that Jesus doesn't hear them or doesn't want to hear them, maybe wants to ignore them as he's traveling along because he doesn't stop until he gets into the house. But then, uninvited, we don't read of any invite, they follow him into the house. Nobody else follows him, apparently, but they're in private now with Jesus, and then is when he would heal them, but not before. So they're crying out, they're persistent, and this shows this kind of faith that is so important for us. You cry out to Jesus, not once, but twice, and all the way into wherever he is for help. And you cry out, and he's the center of your attention. It doesn't matter. You're blind to everything else. Let's say it that way. Are we ever like that? When we pray, is this prayer for us a model or a rebuke? This crying out in their desperate need for this Savior, this Lord, and they feel it, and they can't see, and they're missing out on life, they think, maybe, but they have this perception of Jesus, and they cry out, be merciful. I think uh, words here to explain and apply uh, are important. The what the blind men show here is that they're not distracted by anything. They don't stop and check their iPhone on the way. They can't, of course. They don't stop and have a cup of coffee, and then we'll go after Jesus later. They're focused. They're focused. Jesus is the center. And that should be the way, of course, with, with all of us in our personal life, but it starts, too, with, let's say, our theology. Dare I say that? Are we sick of theology and doctrine and so on? But I will. I will dare. Theology must have as its center Christology. Christ! There must be Messiah in all of our tomes and and. All of the volumes we write about God and his sovereignty and God in, in his infinity and in his, in his wonderful eternity and so on. And, and all of these 
decrees we come up with regard to these things. There must be Jesus. There must be Jesus held high. Jesus crucified, Jesus risen, Jesus coming again, Jesus in all of his personhood, Jesus in his humanity and his divinity, Jesus as his Savior, ministers calling people to believe in Jesus and to follow him like these blind men. And to know the first thing about life, it's in Jesus. He's the way to God. And he's the way that you must go if you would go from God and follow where God leads. He's the way, the truth, and the life. I regret to say almost, or I'm dismayed to say, that a lot of theology nowadays is not also Christology, Christ-centered, and a lot of preaching is perhaps some theology, but usually a little of morality here and a little of psychological advice there. We need Christ crucified, preached, Christ risen, preached, Christ Jesus who heals the blind, preached. We need the call, repent and believe. Of all your distractions, repent of them. Of all of this past week's complainings, repent of them and go to Jesus. And you see, there's something here that reminds us that In addition to Jesus being preached, in complement with Jesus being preached, you and your greatness and me and mine may not be preached. If Jesus would be preached, we have to preach a Jesus who would show us mercy and of which mercy the blind men again lead the way because that's what they're crying out for. Have mercy on us, they say. Don't reward us according as we deserve, as we merit. We have no right to see. We have no right to life itself or liberty or happiness or health care, anything. We need mercy from God. And if Christ be preached, the Savior, the Lord, the Son of David, it must be that you're not preached. And I'm not preached. And no man's merit is set forth as something by which we go up to God. Only mercy coming down from God. Because mercy is simply grace to help the helpless. If grace is unconditional favor and free favor, uh, expressing the love of God, mercy is that favor to the helpless, the blind, the maimed, the sinner. Jesus Christ himself says in this book, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's showing mercy here. And this is what they do. They recognize Messiah and all he is, and this is by the faith that's joined them to him and to spiritual things. So they lead the way. And then Jesus And they're now in the house, my second point. He said to them, do you believe I'm able to do this? Now, children, Jesus knew what was on their minds. But when he asks a question, do you believe that I'm able to do this? He's eliciting from them their faith. And they indeed have their faith elicited. They say to him, yes, Lord, yes, we believe that you're able to do this. And, of course, what they're confessing here is that they believe Jesus has power to do this. They believe he has power to do this. They've also, however, expressed that he has the will to do this because he's merciful. They're coming to him, and they will not be denied, not because of their assertions and their pressing, but because he is this merciful one. They, they know that. They sense this. They've heard from people He's healing these people. He, he sits with Matthew, the publican. He, he's, this, he's this Messiah of whom we can hardly understand him because his ways are not the ways of the Pharisees. And he's not this elitist. And it's not about hierarchy. It's about this Jesus Savior. 
and they are confident in his mercy and in his ability. So they say to him, and imagine what this would look like. You know, they're, they're shouting, Son of David, have mercy on us. And now they're face to face with Jesus in maybe this little room in the quiet and outside of the crowds. And then he's dealing with them personally. And he's looking them in the eye. Of course, they can't see it. And maybe you think they're starting to tremble here. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Maybe they're starting to think they've been a, a bit presumptuous. Who knows? And then he touched their eyes and said, and was saying as he touched their eyes, touching, isn't it? According to your faith, let it be to you. According to your faith. Now, this isn't on the basis of your faith, but it's the word according to. <laughs> according to your faith, let it be unto you. Jesus is simply saying here, since you believed, and faith is the way that people receive things, so be it. And immediately their eyes were opened. That's all he's saying. Some people like to say, according to the measure of your faith, so you have it. And some people have said, if faith is like a hand, if you have a big hand, a lot of faith, you're going to be able to receive a lot more. Oh, there's something maybe to that. I don't think that's taught here. It's simply this. Faith is the way of receiving things from God. Believing in Jesus. Not believing in yourself, not believing just in your sin and sinfulness and, and you're just stuck there, but believing in Jesus, believing in his power, believing in his presence, believing in his purpose to save and to heal sinners, and in his promise that he will hear those who call upon him. This is faith here. And that's what he's saying. There is a correlation between believing and receiving. Faith is the way that we receive. I think our Belgian Confession doesn't it say it's the, the hand that receives from God. It's a way of describing this mysterious connection between God through Christ, who is the way, and this thing called faith, whereby we receive things from heaven. Now, Jesus isn't saying here, everyone who has enough faith will be healed of their blindness, of their COVID, or whatever else they have. This is not, nor are any of the miracles, an argument for maybe Pentecostalism that says that all of these healings would be ours if we simply had enough faith. I remember in the hospital, my wife, a bunch of healers came by. Somehow they let them in. And they wanted to pray over my wife. And I knew what they were all about. And I said, no way. We prayed God's answering our prayers. If she gets better, he answers our prayers. If she doesn't, he answers our prayers. They went away wondering and probably thinking I was an unbeliever. But beloved, let's not be led astray by that kind of notion or the notion that Jesus is teaching this here. According to anyone's faith, if they have enough faith, you're just going to be, your, all your blindness is gone and your bank account will be restored and everything else. No, that's not the way of Jesus. He's teaching here, you see, by these physical miracles, something that confirms the spiritual, which we cannot see except by faith and we cannot enjoy except by faith. But here he is saying to these men, in this personal attention he gives to them, these believing sons of God, sons themselves of Abraham, according to your faith, let it be to you. So that's what he's saying. And he's speaking of the fact that there is this important connection that he has, or that he has given between faith and answers to prayer. And so that would be the application here. Even though it's not, well, you get healed and all of your problems go away, because you believe, that's not the case. Nevertheless, according as we believe, God answers. This is a way here that's described in, in very important language here. 
As we believe, we are heard of God. As we come to Him and we know a need, and there is in our hearts impressed upon us the need for mercy to understand, to know, to have from God what we need as a young person, as a single person, as a married couple, as parents and grandparents, as Church of Christ. As we come, as we know this need, we're communing with God and nothing else matters, and Jesus is passing by. We say, Son of David, have mercy on us. He's passing by in our contemplation. He's passing by. He was no longer on the earth, but is in heaven. But he's in our minds, and it comes to mind that we need something, and we believe that he can heal us and he can help us. We say, Jesus, have mercy on us and help us. And he, he hears, according to your faith, let it be to you. Have you heard this from Jesus lately? Has he said to you in so many words, according to your faith, let it be to you? Have you heard answers to prayer? Really? I wonder if we've heard, but our problem is we're deaf and blind. So often he answers our prayers and it's right in front of us and we're looking for something else. But it's right in front of us. Something clear that we have to do. Something clear that he has done. We can't get out of it. We must receive it. This is an answer to prayer. And I believe that a lot of our discontent would just flee away. As the sighs and sorrows will flee away from uh, from heaven. So our discontent on earth would flee away. If we'd understand that right before us is an answer to prayer. Right yesterday was an answer to prayer. Right in our being struck sick, right in our being made healthy, right in our seeing this, right in our avoiding an accident here, is an answer to prayer. If we'd see this, our faith would be quickened, we would be happy, we would go obey, shouting for joy and spreading the news of the God who hears prayer and the God who's our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Well, that leads to this point, the last one. These blind men were told sternly, shh, quiet. Don't let anybody know. Wow. This seems not to fit. Now, Jesus is not saying, see that no one knows that you're healed. (laughs) That would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? You're healed and you can see, and now you're supposed to shut your eyes and keep going, no. The idea is that they are not to let anyone know that he did it. The problem was, when they departed, they spread the news about him in all that country, and he didn't want that. Jesus did not want this healing to be advertised, broadcast, the subject of a sermon by those two blind men. He sternly warned them, and the language here is stern and full of warning. It's like the language of a threat or the language of groaning. Two times in the Gospel according to John, chapter 11, when Jesus is groaning about Lazarus' death, that's the word. He's groaning. He's, he's moved here. He tells these people, don't say anything. Now, he doesn't do this all the time, but we've met this already. He has straightly charged people, don't say anything. And we don't know if they did or not, but these people we read are disobedient. He said, see that no one knows it. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Clear to you children, isn't it? See that no one knows that I did this. But when they had departed, they were so overwhelmed with joy, enthusiasm, they spread the news about him in all that country. No further comment about that from Jesus or anything else in the gospel here. But this is clearly a case of disobedient evangelism. And you might wonder why. Or why is Jesus saying you should not do this? Let's consider that first. Why? Well, 
the common answer, and I think this is pretty accurate, is that Jesus knows the pulse of the society. They're not ready for him. They're not, there needs to be more explaining, more miracle works, and more understanding that he hasn't come to be a political messiah. He's not a Democrat. He's not going to be handing out things. He's not a Republican either. He's the Savior. He is the one whose kingdom is spiritual, whose life is spiritual, who gives spiritual life, something not coming with observation, he says, is this kingdom. And so they're not getting this, nor are they understanding that this will only be in the way of suffering. It won't be in the way of crowning him king. He is the son of David, like Solomon. He will now take over the Romans, kick them out, and establish a new earthly um, Jerusalem as his capital and Israel as his nation. He's not come to do that. They can't get it, though. You see, these people, these blind men, and the society, they're not ready for w this other miracle being told about him. And, and Jesus w reminds them of this and warns them about this because he will not be prematurely crowned the king without going the way of the cross. That's truly sure, uh, for sure here. It could be as well, though, because Jesus doesn't say this all the time, that he knows the hearts of these blind men now seeing and that it would not be good for them to be publishing this about. I don't know. I'm not, nobody really knows exactly why, but certainly the, the, we're aiming here and Jesus is aiming toward the timing of his demise of his of his being crucified and the way that it will be and it won't be at the hands of men who mangle him about and do what they want he will be doing what he will and that's going right to the cross he has the cross in mind so we think of that so here they are disobedient there's no there's no understand our understanding of anything else that's going on here they are simply disobedient they had departed they spread the news about him in all that country well you might think this is pretty good disobedience because after all they're so full of joy and this is what we do right Jesus isn't saying that for all time this is the case you you can't tell about me of course not later on he'll say Go into all the world and teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And the very next chapter, he calls out the disciples who are going to spread the news about Jesus. But not here, not with these people. The fact is they're disobedient. They are disobeying him. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that there is a comment here about so much of the evangelism that goes about in our day so much of the spreading of the news. These people, these blind people, they came to Jesus and they learned something about him, but they didn't learn obedience. And they thought they could be holier maybe than Jesus or faster than Jesus, who was so, too slow and so on, and they're just going to spread the news, and certainly Jesus will be happy about that. No. Jesus is happy to be obeyed. They've just confessed he's Lord. So listen to him. That's what he's saying. Listen to me. Show that you know something of the school of discipleship and obedience. And no matter if you can't understand it, learn it and be quiet. Now this again could be the words that the whole entire evangelicalism world needs to hear. Be quiet. In other words, in this endeavor where you think you have an open door, even though you're going to have to compromise the gospel, don't you dare do that. In this way that you're seeking to dumb down the worship and your evangelism and bringing in the neighborhood and taking a poll of the neighbors what they want and what kind of latte they want in the narthex, in this, rethink it. Because Jesus wants us to go out into the world his way and his time. And sometimes going out into the world, oftentimes, is disobedient the way we want to do it. 
the way we want to do it. One has said that one of the one word that people seem to take with the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is go. 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 Oh, okay. Women, you go. Teenagers, you go. You just go. Go and do what? Well, try to be a witness to, to Christ. But Jesus also says in that Great Commission, go and teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. There's, there's detail to that. Go as church. Go not just as parachurch and some crusade movement. Go as church of Jesus Christ to whom are the keys of the kingdom given. Go in my way, my order, into all the world. But sometimes it won't be this place you want to go to. But it's wherever I send you. Remember in the apostles' journeys, the Holy Spirit forbade them to go here and forbade them to go there. And they needed a vision of the Macedonian man to say, now you go here. But we, thinking that God is love and he wants to save everybody, therefore he must want us to go everywhere, we have it differently. But we're not thinking theologically and Christologically and according to the holy marching orders of Jesus Christ. At evangelism, I say, is oftentimes where the faith or unbelief of a church is proven or disproven. So we need to be careful. But this is with regard to everything, and this is how I will conclude. If you, will, if you have been healed by Jesus, saved by Jesus, if you've been one whose prayers have been answered by God in the name of Jesus, do what Jesus tells you to do, and all will be well. Be happy. Oh, be happy. And this is what's commendable in these two blind men. They're kicking up their heels for joy. And by the way, that's often our problem. We don't go at all because we have no enthusiasm. But be happy, kick up your heels, and be holy at the same time. Jesus has spoken. Jesus has healed. Son of David, Son of God, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thanks, Lord, for this word. We pray that we may, having heard it, understand just how wonderful you are to save us sinners. You've had mercy upon us, and we cry out for it, Lord, continually. And Lord, we pray that you would help us, having been heard by you, to go your way with joy, with godliness, and with deliberation and purpose. Hear us that everyone may know that healing, Every one of this congregation, all your people everywhere may know that healing and know that commission and know the wonderful power we have from on high to spread the good news, your time, your way, and for the gathering of your people. For Christ's sake, amen.